You're listening to a message from New Beginnings Lakeside Church. Today's speaker is Pastor Doug Horner. So we, we are officially in fall, October 1st. Uh, I guess September 23rd was actually the first day of fall, but, uh, but we're, we're uh, feeling the fall, I guess fall festival this week downtown, uh, filled with all kinds of wonderful, nutritious food. Uh, <laughs> We have Fam Jam on October 22nd, which is a great night. Thank you so much for those of you who are bringing candy in. Um, there's still plenty of time to do that, but uh, we're so, we just love to uh, let the kids come, families come, individuals come, just have a fun night. Uh, there'll be a time of, of uh, inspiration in terms of uh, the gospel presentation. We do that every year. Uh, just a, a great night of music and, and, and just games and just uh, hay rides, all kinds of stuff going on here. We've got the barrel uh, train going. So uh, please be talking to, to people about it. We're going to be sending some advertisements out. Share those on social media for us. Uh, just opportunity to, to connect people uh, with, with the Lord and uh, with New Beginnings. So thankful for that. And then today, October 1st, is Pastor David's birthday. So, happy birthday. He's back there. So, uh, I got a couple pictures, because uh, being the dad, I can, uh, there, this is my favorite picture all time. This is their mama, their wonderful mama. That shows the kind of mama she is. Unbelievable. And that's uh, David there on uh, your right, and uh, is that right? Yep, your right, and Joel uh, uh, on the left there, and David just before he got his beard, just before. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's been a few years ago. And then here's that picture, right? The next picture, that is Pastor David at nine years old playing worship set at uh, Center Point on the east side. That's two, about two years before he's touring uh, nationwide in the Mission 6. It's crazy. And then he was like 11 years old when they started getting the opportunity to go out and did that for about 10 years. So anyway, God is good. God is good. And God has raised up some great uh, men. Um, in leadership here at the church, Nathan Crow, David Horner, Joel Horner. Let's give it up for them. And make sure you, you wish David a happy birthday. So uh, we are getting so close. Uh, we're at the end of 27. Uh, we will not finish that today. Uh, I just want to let you know ahead of time. Because um, we're talking about the death of Christ. Uh, I believe that takes two weeks. One week is just to talk about uh, God moving Through that, uh, while he was on the cross to his death, I felt very uh, passionate to to speak towards that uh, today. And then next week, I'm coming back uh, to teach about uh, the tomb and the the women of uh, that served the Lord and uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, I want to talk about those. And within regards to the tomb, what happened? Uh, between the time that Jesus died and he was resurrected. I want to speak to that. There's uh, scripture throughout that I want us to look at. So that, that's these, uh, these next two Sundays. And then the following Sunday, we'll get into uh, Matthew 28, which is the resurrection and the Great Commission. And uh, so excited about that. So we, you know, we've been on this journey uh, for a little over a year and a half. So it's great uh, to be at this place and... Um, and to speak towards God moving. That's uh, the title of the message this morning, God Moves. Uh, we're going to go backwards a little bit. Uh, Pastor David spoke to some of these verses last week, but um, I'm going to come at it from a little different angle. That's how wonderful the Bible is. Uh, there's so much you can glean from it. Uh, so we're going to start at verse 45 uh, and work our way through verse 54 this morning. So uh, now from the sixth hour... There was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Uh, So that would be essentially, um, that would be noon um, to um, around, uh, or let me think about this. Yeah, I think noon uh, to 3 p.m. is what we're looking at here. Darkness. uh, And God's movement, God moves, he's judging And the number one thing I want us to look at, there's going to be six things. We're going to move through this very quickly. So if you need notes, there's notes at the back uh, of seats by the uh, giving box. Um, You can go pick one of those up really quickly. But uh, darkness fell upon all the land. That is the the movement of God. And I want to speak to that for a minute. 
Um, it's the first move of God. And one of the things I want us to look at is, is that what was God doing all this time during uh, the crucifixion, during the trials, during this crucifixion, what was God doing? He wasn't just standing by waiting for it to happen. No, uh, Jesus had spoke to uh, the fact uh, in his teachings that, you know, the Father is always at work around us. And so the Father was working. God was moving in the midst of this, and this darkness that fell upon the land, uh, it lasted from uh, 12 noon to 3 p.m. He was crucified at 9 a.m. Jesus was crucified. At the, the Jewish day began at 6 a.m. in the morning. By 9 a.m., Jesus is on the cross. And from 9 a.m. to noon, uh, we have um, a picture. We have some things that jo- Jesus said. You know, he, he, he didn't say anything in his trial uh, except in answering the question uh, like if he was the king, and, and you know, he did say, um, it is as you say, or I am uh, as you say. Uh, but in Luke 23, 34, he said, you know, at one point between nine and noon, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was a powerful moment as his uh, cruci- crucifiers were around him, and the people were around him. And then um, in verse 43 of that same chapter, Luke 23, we have Jesus uh, who speaks to the penitent thief on the cross. There were two thieves, remember. And one, you know, said, remember me, uh, to, you know, when you get to heaven. He said, truly today you will be with me in paradise. Powerful moment uh, for that uh, thief, you know, uh, powerful moment. And then in John 19, 26 and 27, we have him speaking to his mother uh, with John there, John uh, the beloved. He said, woman, behold your son, and uh, son, behold your mother. He put his own mother in the care of John. Those were things that he said from nine to noon, but then darkness, God's first movement at the cross was this at the highest point of the day of the sun, uh, an amer- this amazing miracle takes place. And there's, there's lots of scholars. Uh, I read through several scholars uh, that were un- unrelated to the Bible. They're not Bible, you know, they're not Bible people. They're not Bible, they're historians. And, you know, one was uh, Origen, uh, who was writing against Celsus, uh, another writer. Uh, Celsus was trying to say that the, uh, you know, the event was happened because of a, an eclipse, you know, a total eclipse of the sun. And there were, that, that was one of the common things as I studied through this. Uh, historically, it's interesting that it's even written about, and, and it's a blessing that it's written about. Because God is, um, is you know, putting an exclamation point on this event that this happened, this, this event, there was an event of darkness around this time um, that is noted in history, and people try to write it off as some, you know, uh, you know weather-related, uh, earth-related thing, and what uh, Origen was writing about, and of course, what the gospel writer of Matthew, Matthew himself was writing, this was a miracle of God. That God, that God made the darkness happen. It's supernatural darkness. It's a divine miracle. And that's a picture for us to understand that in the Bible, darkness symbolizes judgment. It's a symbol of judgment, whereas salvation is spoken of as light. Uh, God's judgment is spoken of as darkness. And this was a time, we're, we're seeing this, uh, and what uh, events are happening on the cross, um, we're seeing that, that Jesus is taking upon the judgment of God Almighty on our behalf, on, on behalf of a sinful world. So darkness fell upon the land. God moves. God judges. That is the picture here. But then we see in verse 46 to 47, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, 
uh, Lama Sabachthani, uh, this, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling on Elijah. Now, uh, they, again, were just trying to respond to what they were hearing, but uh, Christ, we, hear, we know from last Sunday teaching, if you want to go back and hear, uh, you can go uh, on any of our uh, social media sites to hear these messages if you've missed any of them. But Pastor David spoke to the reality that, that the crucifixion itself is uh, delineated in Psalm 22. And these very words, these very words are fulfillment of prophecy. So we know that that they're familiar, of, uh, uh, you know, they were, you know, spoken of long before Christ ever speaks them from the cross. But what God does here in his move is this is Jesus carrying the penalty of sin. And, for, and so therefore, it's forsaking Jesus the Son. It's forsaking Jesus the Son. Because he is carrying the penalty of your sin and my sin, the sins of the world. And this demonstrates the second move of God, the first being darkness, which represents judgment, and now the forsaking of the Son. And it seems impossible. This moment in the, the process of Jesus' crucifixion when he is separated, there's a separation God cannot look upon sin. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That's 1 John 1, 5. It's impossible for for God to share uh, in the darkness. So there is a forsaking. It's 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 a miraculous moment because we have... Uh, A moment where God separates from God. How is that possible? How can the Trinity be divided? How can the Father be divided from the Son? How can God forsake his own Son when they are of one essence? And it's a strange miracle. But Jesus at this time is carrying the penalty of sin, the judgment of of God is coming upon him in this darkness, which is represented by the sun being uh, darkened that, at, that, at that time. And then Jesus is crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And notice, this is the first time, and Pastor David spoke to this last week, it's, it's the first time that he doesn't refer to uh, the Father as the Father, but as God. So verse 48 And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. They thought, you know, he he was thirsty. One, two, um, this gall uh, was a uh, a, a elixir, uh, a a really cheap elixir uh, for for uh, for these kind of moments to help maybe numb some of the pain. Obviously, he'd been in agony for hours. Uh, Not just because of the crucifixion, which by now he's been crucified for three hours, but uh, because of the the severe beating he had taken. Uh, But verse 49 said, but others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. I just think that their fixation on Elijah is hilarious. Uh, But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And each time he cries out, I, I want us to understand The language for that crying out is not some little tiny whimper. He's crying out uh, with great energy. That's the intent every time he cries from the cross. Uh, As I was going through his cries, uh, the language is yelling, screaming. It's powerful. It's not not a quiet uh, whimper. And and that's to show you that even in the immense agony and the process of uh, just absolute bodily exhaustion, Jesus Christ was still very much in control of these moments. And here he yields up his spirit. He's not going slowly and fading into some sort of coma, which some crucified people had done in those days. He's not dying of exhaustion He yields up his spirit when the time is right. 
And the moment is right. John chapter 19, verse 30 says this. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head up, uh, head and gave up his spirit. Now, this is a moment where God moves uh, and Jesus' work is finished. And God is accepting, number three, God is accepting Jesus' sacrifice. If it comes to this moment where he had taken on the sins of the world, past, present, and future, our sin. He was looking ahead. God was looking ahead to our sin and to the sins of people in the world that are to come. And his sacrifice was accepted. Jesus had reached the point and he cries out, it is finished. What was finished? It, what was finished was the work that he had come to do, and that was to be a savior of the world. It's a powerful moment. It's a powerful moment. The work was done. The price was paid for your sin, my sin. God is satisfied. So Jesus sent his spirit out of his body, and with that, he physically dies. I think it's important to note doctrinally that Jesus physically died. We know this. Uh, because at, at one point when they came, uh, I was been reading through all the different Gospels, and I can't remember, um, I've been through all, all of them through this. But at one point, they came to break the legs to expedite uh, the death, and they broke the legs of the thieves. But when they went to break the legs of Jesus, uh, he was already dead. And there was one, one passage that spoke to how uh, one, of the, one of the guards, one of the soldiers, pierced his side, and blood and water uh, flowed. Jesus was physically dead. He didn't go into the tomb, and, you know, he went, went into some sort of coma, and he was able to come out, and that's the reason why, you know, he raised from the dead, because, you know, he was pretending to be dead. No, he was dead. It's important that we understand this doctrinally, and that God accepts Jesus' sacrifice. John 10, 18 says this, no one takes it from me, but I lay, down, uh, I lay it down of my own accord. What's he speaking of? His life. No one takes his life, this life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There's a picture there of Isaiah 53. So he knew the Father was ready to receive him, and so therefore the sacrifice was enough. There was sufficient and the sin-bearing work was finished, and God was satisfied. So Jesus knew when the Father forsook him. He knew when uh, he was welcomed back because the sin uh, had been forgiven. This, the, his sacrifice was uh, acceptable. So God is moving God is moving in the crucifixion. He, he turns out the brightness of the sun. He forsakes his own son. And he moves when he, being satisfied, satisfied, he welcomes his son back. So then we move to uh, a fourth one. It's, look at verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Now, you know, when we, when we think, well, look at this, we read this passage, this particular uh, passage in, in, the, in, the, in the whole account, part of us, because we weren't around this area, we didn't grow up in Judaism, we, we think, what's the big deal? What, what's the big deal about the curtain of the temple being torn, you know? And just note again, it's from top to bottom. And so, first off, it's the fourth point. God moves. He, he says to come in. He says to come in, and it's a tearing the temple veil in two. Now, we studied the temple, the Holy of Holies, the, 
um, the holy places and the holy of holies, naas is the word, if you remember, there's a word specific for all the areas in the temple. There's actual a place around the temple for Gentiles like you and, and I when it, was, you know, when it was built, when they were using it. So the Gentiles would go in. There was a place as far as Jewish women could go in, and then there was a place as far as Jewish men could go in, but there were walls are surrounding each of those areas. As a Gentile, I couldn't just go anywhere. There would be a point, a line of no return, where if I, as a Gentile, crossed that line, uh, the soldiers first would try to say, hey, you can't go any further. And if I went further, then I'd be, it'd be punishable by death. Of course, it would be death in relationship to uh, it, uh, the Romans. Remember, Ro- the Rome, Rome had taken their authority uh, for capital punishment. That is why Jesus is dying in a crucifixion because they brought him to, to Roman you know, leaders, governor, uh, to uh, try and get him to be crucified or to be ex- you know, executed. But understand that that was one thing, but men and women, they can only go so far. And even the priest Even the priests could only go so far. They could go into the holy places in preparation uh, for the services, the worship of God. But only the high priest, only the high priest could go in to the holy of holies one time a year and make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. It was the day of atonement. Once a year, once a year into The Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant uh, resided. And there would be blood sprinkled on behalf of the nation, further sins on the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was so serious a, a place that only the high priest once a year could go in that they would put bells on him and tie a rope to him. And, and, and they would, he would go in, and if he was unclean in any way, and God would, you know, uh, kill him, smite him, no one could go in to get him. They literally tied the rope on him to drag him out because no one wanted to go in. Only the high priest was allowed to. That's how, that's how deep this was. So this veil, this temple veil, kept people out there once a year. One person, the, the high priest, could go in uh, on behalf of the people. He stood between God and the people. And people were shut out of God's presence. So the temple veil, um, Alfred Edersheim, a Jewish scholar, said the temple veil, that huge curtain, was about 60 feet tall. Pretty big uh, height. Um, it was 30 feet wide. And it was thick. It was five, four to five inches thick. They said like a, a man's hand. Four to five inches thick. That's how when, when, when the tabernacle in the wilderness, they, they, they actually literally copied the, the temple from this, uh, from the tabernacle and the tabernacle's like uh, curtain was very flimsy. It was uh, it was you know um, easily moved. But but this by the time they build the temple, this curtain, they believed that in the holy of holies was the dwelling of Almighty God. Josephus said it was an ornate, mostly blue veil with 24 sections, and they continue to add cloth again, and then the thickness. They sewed on it and sewed on it year after year uh, so it wouldn't be torn. It was thick. It wasn't, you know, um, I had a friend that was in the power team, and they did all those phone books, and they were telling me about the founder, uh, John Jacobs, uh, who was out in California, and he just got to uh, um, one of these events like 20 years ago. It's been a long time ago. And, and the, the guys who had been there doing their shows, their feats of strength, um, they could not tear the New York phone books. They were struggling. And so John Jacobs comes and he says, I, I, you know, gets on the stage that night and, 
And he's like, I understand uh, the boys couldn't uh, tear the phone books here in New York. Give me, give me a phone book. And so he got a phone book, and he said, bring me a second. Brings a second one out, and he rips two phone books right in front of everybody. That's unbelievable. That's, that's powerful. But I guarantee you John Jacobs could not rip, tear the veil, especially from top to bottom. It was torn from top to bottom. Why is it specific towards that? Because God himself did this. This was a miracle from God. This was God himself uh, tearing the temple veil in two. And God was saying, welcome, come in. Whereas their religion, their, the way they did things, their system um, all those courts that, you know, different people at different levels, you know, Gentiles could go this far, women could go this far of, of the Jewish faith, men of the Jewish faith could go this, you know, far, the priests could go this far, the whole, you know, the high priest was the only one into the Holy of Holies. All their message was keep out. But in this moment, God was saying to you, to me, to all people, come in. Come in. That's God's message. There's no borders anymore. There's no boundary anymore. There's no more need for a day of atonement because the ultimate sacrifice has been made. No more uh, need for the high priest because we have our priest. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, that man Christ Jesus. So no more sacrifices, no more barrier. And really, it would be in AD 70. We, we studied that um, many, many months ago um, in the fact that the Romans would come in and trample down uh, J- Jerusalem and the temple and it would never be rebuilt. It has not been rebuilt to this day. Jesus is our mediator between God the Father and us. And it's beautiful. It's, it's powerful. So G- God is moving and tearing the temple veil in two. He says, come in. So in verse 51 also, uh, along with the curtain veil, it says, let me read it again. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split Verse 52, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So um, the fifth thing is this, God moves uh, eternal life. It's the resurrection of the saints, number five, resurrection of the saints, the move of God and the resurrection of the saints here. And, and it's getting a bizarre, isn't it? And it getting bizarre. I guess you can't say that about God. I, I, that's what I love about God. Because God, you know, he makes things happen. We go from an earthquake to the veil being torn uh, to now uh, uh, the walking dead. You know, is it a bunch of zombies? No. <laughs> no. But why did this happen? What is all this about? Well, God is giving us, he's showing us, because of the, the, the sacrifice that was acceptable through uh, Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Christ from the dead, God is showing us a preview of what's to come for those who are saved and that there is going to be a resurrection and we studied this uh, again a few weeks ago. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who are in Christ, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we, when we die before the rapture, if you're saved... Uh, If you've given your life to Christ, when we die uh, before the rapture, then uh, uh, then, uh, we will will meet uh, those who have died before. Those are the dead in Christ first will rise, and our bodies will be uh, made 
whole. We'll have perfect bodies at that point. Until that, we are to be, we're absent from the body and we're present with God. We're, we're with, with Christ. But there will be a new model, a new body. And so there is going to be a resurrection. And I find that it's very important that we not overlook this little moment because it's easy just to walk by. I don't know how often, you know, I've studied this through the years and just walked by that little moment about dead people raising. It's not a surprise. We've experienced it uh, with uh, Jairus' daughter. We experienced it, remember, when Jesus saw uh, the funeral procession uh, with the, the, the son of the mother, of the widowed mother, and, and he raised that young man back to life. We know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But we will all, all of us, those who are in Christ, praise the Lord, all, all who are in Christ will have a, a resurrection. This is not it. This is a small time. You know, I was, I was kind of factoring that out as I was understanding how old David is. I'm not going to tell you how old David is. He's, he's over nine. I'll just tell you that. All right? And the thing is, it's like, man, you know, life keeps moving on. I get older physically, but not mentally. I'm still, I'm still young at heart in my mind. I'm still that, you know, young man. I still have that desire and that, you know, looking at life for what God has got, in, you know, in store. It's not done. And really, until God takes us home, we need to have a heart. We're just like, God, what is it you want? I mean, I, it's not over till it's over. But then I get, I rejoice in the truth. I mean, I, I remember those were the conversations I had with my dad on his, on his few last days. Um, and one of the things he kept saying is, I just don't want to leave you guys. And I get that. And he wouldn't say that today and because he's, he's in heaven. He's, he's with God the Father. And that's, I mean, that, it's hard from this side to, exp- to understand that at the level he understands now. My mom understands now. And those of our loved ones who are in Christ who have gone on to be with the Lord understand beyond belief. And we live with that hope every day. There is going to be a resurrection. So we come to the last, last moment of movement before, I mean, God obviously moves in so many other ways. This is his last movement. But here at the cross, because now Christ has died. He has, he, he, he has given up his spirit and his body has ceased to live on this planet for the moment. Verse 54 it says, when the centurion and those who were with him, guarding him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, reverent fear. I got that, you know, in my, my notes. Uh, guarding him was also, a, I put in my notes, uh, who were with him. They were guarding him. They were keeping watch over Jesus. And they were filled with awe. That's a reverent fear. Uh, said, truly, This was the Son of God. So the last movement I want us to look at this morning is this. God moves in capturing hearts. He's capturing hearts. And there's this confession by the centurion. Now, I'm not trying to, to will this centurion into heaven, but he sure makes a serious confession here. He makes a serious confession. We're going to look at that for a moment as we close this morning. And there are some many scholars that believe that this centurion and some of the soldiers, because uh, Matthew uh, um, speaks to the fact that other soldiers were with him and saying this. Uh, The other gospels speak specifically just to the centurion. And remember, a centurion soldier, a centurion was a commander over 100 other soldiers. That's why they use the term centurion. And here are these, this centurion and these guards that are watching over Jesus. 
And it's believed that these would have been the guards watching over Jesus from the beginning of this whole, uh, uh, you know, venture. They had been with him in the garden. They had been with him in uh, all the trials. And in such a place that the guards, you know, guards are with the prisoner at all times. And that there were moments where things were said that they heard that people hadn't heard, normal people hadn't heard. Because they were with, they were with Jesus throughout. They believe that these people would have been the ones that would have scourged Jesus. They believe they would have been the ones to pin him to the cross and raise him on to this cross and crucifixion. And they would have stood by, as we know here, they're standing by waiting for the events to transpire that these criminals would die. So the centurion and some of these guards, these soldiers, it says that they make this confession, truly, this was the Son of God. These guys saw the earthquake and all those things that were occurring, the darkness that took place, and they were filled with awe. The King James says they feared greatly. The NIV says they were terrified and they entered into a state, the word phobeo is the word, it's where we get the word phobia that we use in our language from, it has to do with terror. They were, they were struck, the sheer terror, state of panic. And it's the same word that's used with Matt in Matthew 14, 26, when the disciples are in fear, when they see Jesus walking on the water. It's the same word that for fear that is used for Baal in Matthew 17, 6 through 7 at the transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And I just wrote out some words, spiritual awe, awe, you know, it's just unbelievable. Struck beyond belief, reverential terror. And it, it is all of a sudden in their, in their minds, in the mind of this centurion, perhaps maybe again, as Matthew alludes to that other of the, the soldiers with him, they come to this conclusion that this is not just another criminal, not just another rebel, a deluded, deranged man or a fake or an imposter. And these miracles they'd seen and these things that they had heard even from the cross, they were amazing and miraculous. And they saw that they were moved, moved movements of God. And so there is some different phrasing that we see within the Gospels here. Truly, this was the Son of God. In Mark 15, uh, he gives us the, you know, verse 39 Father, I, into, my, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It was immediately after that. He, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. Um, that was, you know, it wasn't only just um, in regards to the miracles that were taking place, but right after he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. So again, they were listening to him. And they make a clear statement. It said, truly, this is the Son of God. It's not maybe it's the Son of God or possibly it's the Son of God. They said, this is the Son of God. In Luke 23, 47, when he said, you know, he says this, uh, and, and in addition, certainly this was a righteous man. And Pilate even had said that in Matthew 27, verse 24, and, and in verse 19, his wife Pilate's wife had said, do not have nothing to do with this righteous man. And here the centurion in Luke 23 is saying, certainly this is a righteous man. So a big part of me believes that this was a statement of faith for this, for this guy. Maybe for these soldiers that were with him. And I find it pretty powerful because in this, 
This was part of the prayer of Christ. Remember, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He had prayed for this. And perhaps this prayer was answered in this man. And there are people in our lives. I I did a sermon many, many years ago, and the title was Centurions Are Watching. It was during an Easter service many years ago. And I, I was just talking about those people around our lives that we think no way. There's no way that that person's coming to Christ. I've had those people in my life. And to my own shame, you know, I've counted them out, but God has not. God did not. And people that I thought there's no way they had ever come to Christ have come to Christ. And it's, it's amazing. It's powerful because God can move in the hearts of anyone. No, no matter how far gone we seem to think they are. And you would think these guys have seen it all. They've watched people die on the battlefield. They, they're hardened and, 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 and you know, just, you know their, their heart has to just be a rock. And here God is showing his mercy in this confession. And it's important to understand that God's grace reaches deep into the lives of people and our job is just is to understand the centurions are watching around our lives. God moves in capturing hearts. It's not up to me to capture the heart of people in this life. It's just up to me to stay as close to the Lord as possible and to walk in, a, in an absolute obedience to what God wants for my life and allow God to move through that. So God is moving. God is definitely moving here. And we see Christ die, succumb to death. He gives his life. He literally gives his life. I I say that all the time. You know, he's more than he just died for us. He gave his life. It was not taken from him, obviously. It was the form of the worst uh, kind of death you could ever experience in this life. But he laid it down for you and for me. So I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us this morning to know that God is at work, not just in this moment here that we're teaching from the word of God. He is at work around us every day and he's at work in your life. And he has a purpose and a plan and a desire for your life and not to settle for anything less. So, Father, thank you so much for uh, this beautiful moment that you've given us just to get inside um, the, some of the movements that you were making uh, with your son on the cross. We thank you for a sacrifice that was acceptable, that it was once and for all, that uh, he is our high priest, that he has opened access. There is no temple veil anymore. It's, it, we have complete access to you through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, for, for those who have given their lives to Christ and, and, and want to just continue to get closer and draw closer, get deeper. Thank you for your word that we can continue to dive in week after week and day after day in our own personal lives and grow deeper in understanding just how far and how wide your love is for us and how much you have in store for us. Lord, we thank you for the hope of resurrection. We thank you uh, for those that have, have followed you and are saved. Lord, I pray for those that may be just on the bubble They're right there, there, that centurion soldier having seen some of the worst of the worst, but they're seeing the best. Right now, they're seeing the best of your sacrifice through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. And so this morning, if you're here and you want to uh, cross that line into salvation and receive a new life, then just pray something like this. Dear Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ who gave his life 
for my sin. Forgive me of my sin and come into my life. And from this day forward, I choose to follow him. Lord, bless this time now too as we come to your table each week as we get to celebrate communion. Your body that was broken, brutally broken for us. And your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.